Um, I declare the meeting open to the public online, and I'd like to welcome all of the members who are participating by video conferencing at this point in time, which is Pam, Paula, Carol, Orlea, and Jerry, um, and myself and Colin McGrath here in the Senate chamber. I want to remind all members about the protocols regarding the use of electronic devices. Um, members, there has been one apology received, which is Jonathan Buckley. And Jonathan has indicated to the clerk that he has assigned his proxy vote to Pam Cameron for today's meeting. So uh, we're not aware of any other apologies, clerk. No, thank you. Okay, members, in chairperson's business, then I would like first of all to mention the report completed this week by the Children's Commissioner on waiting times for children. There was some harrowing information, I have to say, contained within that report. Um, and, and I, I, I believe there are further concerns arising today in terms of further cancelled operations. And I think we would all agree that the impact on children is, is horrendous, impact on family is horrendous, uh, concern, anxiety and impact on health are all massive issues. And in particular, I think we are all very conscious of the health needs of children. But would members be content to be right to the department as a matter of urgency to request an update on the waiting list for children and information on the actions being taken by the department to address those issues. Members content? Yeah, thank you. Members, the, uh, in terms of the period products bill, myself and the clerk had a meeting with the chair of the education committee and the clerk's assistance in relation to the committee stage of Pat Catney's private members bill on period products. Due to the cross-cutting nature and this committee's workload with other bills, the chair of the education committee agreed to take on the committee stage of that bill. We will, of course, be consulted with and can put across our views to the educa Education Committee in due course. But I'd just like to thank the, uh, the, the committee for that, and that's a, a, useful, a useful step. Uh, the other issue of note is that the Hospital Parking Charges Bill was introduced on, the, uh, in, on Monday in the Assembly by Fra McCann, um, Fra's final act here in this Assembly, uh, given that he's retiring. But are members content that the clerk arrange with the proposer of the bill to brief the committee in advance of the second stage. Yep, members content, thank you. And then members also to report that I did a meeting this week with the Royal College of Occupational Therapists, and just to indicate that they, like many other health professionals, share the concerns around workloads, around a uh, workforce, and how, how they can cope, and uh, you know the, the very many solutions and expertise and, and uh, their contribution to the overall health care needs are sometimes not fully considered or early enough considered, and that there is potential there in common with all of the other allied health professionals in terms of um, providing primary health care and secondary and tertiary health care indeed, and that day I, I said I would reflect that back to the committee. Thank you, members. Moving on then to the draft minutes, I refer members to the draft minutes of the meeting of the 14th of October at tab 3.1. Um, there are a number of matters arising then from those minutes, members. Firstly, the three legislative consent memoranda have three of those legislative consent memoranda. We, we looked at four last week. Three of those have been laid in respect of the provisions of the Health and Care Bill relating to professional regulation, medicines and medical devices, information systems and international health care. I refer members to tabs 4.1 to 4.3 of the pack. Uh, I will ask the clerk to outline the process then for considering those LCMs. Clerk. Thanks, Chair. Just to outline, as, as the Chair has highlighted, three of the LCMs have been laid. Um, the one that hasn't been laid was the arms length bodies and the transfer of functions. Um, so that was the last one we were briefed on last week. Um, so the committee process is that once they're laid, we have 15 working days to report on the LCMs. So that gives us until the Friday the 12th of November to produce a report. So following last week's briefing, we had a number of issues that the department agreed they would come back on. So I'm hoping to get that response um, in the next few days. And then we'll look to schedule, if required, another briefing from the department just to clear up those issues and allow members if there's any further queries um, before finalising a, a report. So. Um, we, we do need to report um, on those LCMs to the Assembly by, by Friday the 12th, so the last chance we'll really have to, to consider the report is essentially the next two meetings, the 4th and the 11th, 
if we require any more information or briefings. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, members content? Yeah, thank you. So, members, then, the commo in terms of the committee motion to extend committee stage of the abortion, safe, abortion service safe access zone bill, are members content with the motion, which is a tab 4.2 of the pack there, just to extend? Yeah, thank you, members. Okay, um, can I draw members' attention to the raised agenda uh, in front of us? That was necessary to facilitate the, the attendance of, of officials and to insert an additional agenda item. Uh, in the meantime, there has been um, a further change. Committee members will be aware that we received significant amounts of information after office hours uh, last night from the trusts. Um, information which is uh, relevant to the autism, the uh, autism private members bill, and information I think of, of significant concern and interest, but. I believe that given that has arrived so late to the committee, it's absolutely impossible to provide the level of legislative scrutiny that we would be expected to provide in this situation. Um, I think that's, that's an issue that's in common with all of the legislation that we're going to be facing over the next, over the next number of months. It's critical, I think, that we uh, ensure that the information this committee needs to apply the scrutiny to apply the analysis to the information we're receiving, that that information is got to us in a timely fashion. I, I believe that it's unprofessional and discourteous to leave it to the last minute in the, in, in the way this has been done, and, it, and it's happened previously. And I think more than, more than anything else, it's absolutely disrespectful of the thousands of people out there who are waiting for autism assessments and for autism services. We discussed this in the Assembly, we debated it, we all agreed that we would do everything we could to provide some support to this sector. This private member's bill will undoubtedly play a role in relation to that, and therefore I think it's crucial that we, uh, we, we treat it with the uh, respect and with the rigour that it deserves. So, members, I would be proposing that we defer this uh, briefing today and that we ask the Department to, to come back and to brief us uh, when we've had time to consider the information. I also think, and the Trust have indicated, that they would um, that they would uh, allow the department to speak on their behalf. Given the amount of information that we have received and the differences in it, I think it's crucial, members, that we do hear from the trusts because there are clearly different approaches, different problems. We're, we're seeing a situation where in the South Eastern Trust there are, I think, 313 assessments waiting. Between Belfast and Northern Trust, there's over 2,400. So, in light of those discrepancies, I think it's, it's vital that the committee hears from the trusts and that the, the committee hears from everyone that they feel relevant and, and in a way that they feel relevant. So, I'll take, a, I'll take comment from members on that and then we'll, we'll uh, just check if the committee agrees. But I'll go to Pam first. Go ahead, Pam, please. Thanks, Chair. Um, I wanted just to, first of all, put on, um, declare an interest, obviously, as the proposer of the Autism Amendment Bill. Um, I just wanted to say that I don't disagree with any of the commentary you've, you've made on this particular issue at this point. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so, members, would, would members then be content that we defer the briefing and uh, reschedule that to allow members to consider the information? Thank you. Okay, members, moving on then to our next item, which is item five. So, the next two items are health protection coronavirus regulations. I refer members to the clerk's memo at page 60 of the pack. Members will remember that these SRs were deferred from last week's meeting. The committee requested further information on SR 276 regarding the rationale for the removal of social distancing requirements, the input of the CMO and CSA, and the modelling. The Department's response is at page 6 of the tabled papers. SR 283 then was in last week's table papers, but the committee deferred consideration to allow for more time to consider its provisions relating to the easement of restrictions. I can advise members and officials is here to brief the committee on the provisions of SR 283 and to answer any further questions members may have in relation to these SRs. So I'd like to now welcome to the committee Ms Ilian Colgan, who is Head of Health Protection Branch 2 in the Department of Health. Good morning, Elaine. Can you hear me there okay? I can indeed, Chair. Thank you. 
Thank you, Elaine. And Mr. Peter Looney, D Deputy Director, COVID Strategy and Recovery within the Executive Office. Can you hear me okay, Peter? So I'm not hearing you there, Peter. You appear to be on mute. Um, so I'll just check again. I know you're hearing me. Still not hearing you, Peter, but similar to last week, I will... So can you hear me now, Chair? Yes, that, that's us hearing you now, Sorry. Peter. Yeah, thank you. Excellent, thank you. Okay, so listen, without further ado then, Elaine, I'll go to yourself uh, for, for the, uh, the update from yourself in relation, the briefing in relation to SR283. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and thank you for the invitation to, to brief members on Amendment 17. Um, we, uh, I'll not go through number 16 again, but obviously Peter and I are happy to address any outstanding queries that would help the committee on that one. Uh, um, so in terms of SR283, this was made on the 11th of October 2021 and came into operation on the 14th of October, with the exception of the, the change of expiry date of the regulations, which came into operation immediately upon making. So amendment number 17 extended the operation date until, of the principal regulations until the 24th of March 2022. It removed the limit of the number of people who could attend an indoor gathering at a private dwelling, so provided that wasn't a large house party or rave. So that has the effect of limiting indoor gatherings at private dwellings to 30 people. It also removed the maximum number who could stay overnight at tourist accommodation. Uh, and it removed the requirement to be seated at an event in a concert hall, theatre or conference hall or other indoor venues being used for those purposes. Amendment number 17 also amends the requirements for visitor and attendee information in the context of large ticketed events. And this was in response to feedback from the industry. Uh, the previous wording or the original wording for that, for that regulation was drafted with hospitality in mind as large venues were not open at the time. Um, so the amendments were made uh, for that sector to enable three things. Um, so firstly, the op uh, it applies for operators of ticketed events with fixed start times to collect the details of the late booker only rather than every ticket holder. It removed the need to record the arrival time where there is a fixed start time of the event and it removed the requirement for premises owners to collect the information as effectively this was duplicating the requirement that was already on the organiser of the event. Um, so that was amendment number 17 and Peter and I are obviously happy to take any questions members might have on that. Okay, thank you and I will um, go now to members. I'll go first of all and I should have actually been chair of business welcomed Colin McGrath back to the to the health committee. Um, you're very welcome, Colin. So we'll go to Colin there for a question first of all. Thank, thank you very much, Chair. And yeah, I feel like I'm back at the first day of school, but the, the, the kid that turned up in uniform when nobody else did because everybody's on virtually and I'm here in the room, but I do have other things to, uh, in the building this afternoon, so I'm happy enough to be here and happy to be back again uh, at this very important committee. Um, thank you very much for the presentation. Um, maybe with, I don't want to get too much into the detail of it, but a lot of what is contained in these is removing restrictions. Um, and I know because we aren't actually in the executive ourselves in terms of members to be able to hear the discussion and the debate, with the actual removal of restrictions and there's no mitigations at the other side to balance that out. And we are looking at increasing numbers uh, of, the, the, of cases within our community and we are looking at um, a, a small but significant variant uh, to the Delta. Was there significant evidence presented to the department in terms of the lack of requirement for mitigations to bring in these easements? Um, so the the executive would have see, been given the information on the kind of case numbers and the the situation in ICU and the wider societal and economic position. Um, but in terms of mitigations, it's maybe worth flagging, which, which I didn't mention, that whenever the requirements for social distancing were removed in Amendment 16 uh, for large venues, that there was guidance introduced around COVID certification uh, that those large venue organisers should, um, in guidance, not law, verify that a person is either vaccinated, that they have had a negative LFD test if they're not vaccinated, or alternatively, um, has has evidence that they have had a recent infection of COVID and have recovered from that. Uh, so that was a mitigation when we removed social distancing and that similar mitigation then will um, be in guidance for hospitality sectors when we remove social distancing from social, from hospitality next week. So there are 
are mitigations in place. It's not law that the mitigations are in place, but there are there is strong guidance that that should be adhered to where possible. Thank you. For, I appreciate that, Elian. Can I just ask, are you aware within the department, is there any um, anybody that is checking, if you've, if you've asked for that guidance, you, you've suggested to people that they should uh, uh, you know, provide some sort of checks, is there somebody within the department that checks that people are checking, or is that just something that it's just there in guidance, and if people do it, they do it, and if they don't, they don't, or is there actually somebody within um, the executive, wider uh, executive bodies that actually says, well, look, we'll go and see if this guidance has actually been adhered to. Um, well, generally speaking, and I'm going to hand over to Peter to, to, to address most of this one, but generally speaking, we do see evidence by, by checking the websites of, of the larger venues in Northern Ireland, and um, the information suggests that it's at least um, being complied with and for those larger events. Um, but Peter might have some more concrete information than we would have at our side. Yeah, in, in relation to that specific mitigation, in relation to uh, domestic COVID status certification, uh, the event sector have been reporting very high uptake uh, in relation to that. I mean, they, they had compliance rates of 98 to 99 percent, uh, and we understood whenever we delved into that with them that uh, about 84 percent of customers were proving their uh, status by way of, of vaccination, and the remainder are proving it by way of, of negative test. Um, some of the event organisers actually also provided test kits on site for those who hadn't uh, got proofs with them. Um, but the mitigations are much, much larger than that. I mean, there, there is still a legal requirement for all operators to have risk assessments, uh, and that applies to hospitality events, a, a range of sectors. Um, and and those, risk, those risk assessments can be, uh, are, are required to be produced on request to uh, a constable. Um, and and that, the, 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 there, there, is, there are processes in, in place for those checks to be carried out. Um, we've also done some um, polling uh, around uh, things like face coverings and social distancing and track and trace information um, just to see what uh, individuals' experiences are whenever they've gone into settings uh, and to see, well, Firstly, how do they feel about uh, the, the requirements for face coverings or social distancing or track and trace information? And then what was the practical experience on the ground? Were they asked for their, their contact details? So the, there are measures in place to try and, and record compliance. It is more challenging, obviously, as things move from uh, regulation into guidance to, to uh, achieve high levels of compliance. Uh, and that is always a, a balancing um, consideration whenever uh, the executive are considering whether relaxations or whether restrictions should be relaxed. Um, but I think they're, they're very mindful of the need to, to balance health, economic and societal considerations. And they're also very mindful of the fact that restrictions are, are, are not permitted to remain for any longer than is considered necessary and proportionate. OK, I think that's a no, was it, to use actually actively checking whether or not uh, people are complying with the guidance? I think I heard that you said that people will report to you. I think I heard you said that you do some studies as to whether people are wearing face masks or not. But have you actively got a department which has people that will check whether people are complying to the guidance? Or, or sorry, you can't comply to guidance, but are adhering to the guidance? Yeah. No, sorry, the, the, the reference to risk assessments was because I, I would expect that many of the measures which are in guidance would appear in the risk assessment, which is a statutory requirement, uh, and there are processes in place for checking that those risk assessments are there and, and are adhered to. Thank you. Thank you, Colin. Okay, Elaine, then, um, going back then to 262 and to the responses we received from the Minister in relation to that. He has indicated here that um, there is modelling and he has provided a link to the modelling. But what I would like to know is, is that modelling, does that modelling provide information specific to the situation on the ground here in the north at any given time? Yeah, so the, the modelling information is, is local, so it is done by the Chief Scientific Advisor and his team, um, and it is entire based on Northern Irish, Northern Irish data. Um, so, so yes, it, it is based on the situation on the ground and the modelling tracks uh, the, the, re, the, the real situation will be sort of put onto that graph as well. So it will track which of the modelling, whether it's the optimistic or the pessimistic or the central model, which is the reality that's happening at any point, which then informs whether um, restrictions, you know, just it forms decisions around restrictions as well. 
Okay, thank you. The, the, the next element then of that is that I note the Minister advising the Committee to write to the Executive Office in relation to the advice, and uh, we understand that that advice is provided to the Executive Office. However, I would like, and I think the Committee would like to know what advice the Chief Medical Officer advised to, uh, provided to the Health Minister. So I think it would be useful for us to get that. Um, the, 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 the issue of the executive office is, is a separate one, but I think in the first instance, I would like to have an, an understanding of what advice was provided by the chief medical officer, chief scientific advisor to the Minister for Health in relation to this easement and indeed, indeed many others, but in particular in relation to this one. So uh, would committee members be content to be right to seek that advice? Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah. The, the, other, the other issue then was in relation to the, the uh, real life testing, if you like, on different easements and how that impacts the transmission. And I know, Peter, that you had referred to there that you check with business about how they feel about the guidance and how they feel about, about those things. And we all understand that businesses have been extremely severely challenged as a result of all of this. But typically, how far behind uh, the transmission rates does the modelling run, and how much are you able then to build into your consideration of this particular SR or indeed future SRs, Liam? Okay, um, Chair, if I may just mention the, the advice by CMO to the Health Minister. Um, so as far as I'm aware, there's no separate advice from the CMO to the Health Minister that's not the general advice that goes to the entire executive. Um, and it, we, it would be the executive office that just need to clear the issue of that. Um, so th if I just may, may mention that. Um, in terms of the modelling, the real life uh, testing on compliance and, and how far behind the model is from real life. So the modeling is updated at the start of every week um, based on the, d the data that happens. Um, usually it's up to Sunday or Monday's data because it's produced on a Tuesday. Um, so the, it is very up to date. Um, the the modeling data for ICU then will, or the, the impact on ICUs is a few weeks behind um, transmission rates, so that's also kind of factored into the considerations at that point. Uh, so it, it is up to date when executive consider it because they consider it at the Thursday meeting from the Tuesday's data before, so it's as up to date as, as we can make it. Um, in terms of real life testing on compliance and easements, uh, I don't know if Peter's any surveys in the field at the moment, that's probably the only thing that I could think of on that score. Um, there's nothing on our side that, that is concrete that looks um, specifically at hard statistics on compliance and, the, and, and how that would impact easements. Um, we, we do obviously try to keep a, a sense around us of, of what the sectors are, are doing in terms of compliance with guidance, um, but it is all just anecdotal from our own experiences. Okay, and, and I want to just reiterate the point that uh, certainly my concern, and I think other committee members' concern, is not so much the evidence, um, the, the, not so much that things are done without evidence, but actually that more needs to be done. And particularly at the juncture we're at at the present time, in terms of the, the reported uh, Delta Plus variant and the impact that might have, indeed other variants that may emerge, um, and, and the, the winter pressures. And we heard some weeks ago uh, at committee here that, that RSV was becoming an increasing problem. We're now seeing that uh, impacting the hospitals. So the point is that we, if we knew a number of weeks ago then, are the restrictions so, uh, in place appropriate to meet the, uh, the, the needs of, of all those considerations? So in relation to that, are you currently looking at the restrictions in light of the Delta Plus and any, any other impacts that may have in terms of transmissibility, uh, seriousness of, of illness or whatever? Um, I'm going to ask Peter, just maybe it might be helpful in that sense to update on the winter planning approach, um, because I think that's probably the most, most relevant. Uh, in terms of Delta Plus, um, I would need to just double check with Ian about any impact that's expected on that one, but it's not something that's been factored in on our side as yet. Yeah. Uh, yes, Chair. I mean, in, in terms of uh, further restrictions being relaxed, we, I think we have got to the point now. Uh, the the First Minister and Deputy First Minister launched the or published the autumn winter plan earlier in the week, um, and, and that indicated that uh, a number of the restrictions would remain throughout the autumn winter period as, as baseline measures. Um, that, that would be subject to the legal requirement that any restrictions that are in place are, are regularly reviewed. So we, although we say they will be there throughout autumn winter, it will be subject to that legal requirement to review. Um, 
other other than that, there there, there is a, a proposal uh, that will probably be looked at today at, at executive just in relation to the messaging around face coverings, uh, and that is just to help it keep pace with the other relaxations which are coming in on the 31st of October. Uh, so face coverings in the automotive plan, it has been confirmed, will remain as a legal requirement throughout. Uh, so we're just slightly adjusting the messaging to, to, to uh, take account of the fact that uh, from the 31st of October, people will be able to stand in, in hospitality. Um, in terms of uh, considering them against future risks, I mean, the, the R paper is published by uh, Department of Health on a weekly basis and is, is shared with all executive colleagues uh, and would provide most up-to-date case data uh, as well as, as any sort of uh, uh, changes or any changes to the risk profile. Uh, and that paper then would be discussed at executive uh, whenever either the formal review is being done or whenever um, restrictions are up for consideration. Uh, and that, that, again, would reflect changes like the, the, the Delta Plus uh, uh, and other, other issues which ministries would need to be made aware of. Okay, final one for me then, for now, is in relation to ventilation. And we've heard that referred to often as a potential mitigation, mitigation factor. Has any advice been provided to business in terms of what that means, other than general ventilation? Are there any standards being worked on, standards being reviewed as yeah. to what would be effective in terms of our, you know, air changes per hour or whatever way that's measured? So what, what is being provided in terms of concrete in, in, information to provide business with the, with the uh, information they need to come up to whatever the standard that would be required to be effective? Uh, yes, Chair, if I can take that. Um, there, there is work ongoing in, in that field. Uh, we've brought together uh, representatives from Health and Safety Executive, PHA and uh, Environmental Health, uh, and they are developing advice which will issue to uh, citizens and to businesses, uh, which will set out what, uh, what good ventilation is, uh, the, uh, even, even simple messages about not recirculating uh, air but break, pulling in fresh air. Uh, it will uh, try and establish standards uh, which would act almost as triggers uh, so that people know when they, they need to, 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 to do something to, to respond to ventilation issues. Um, and that would probably at this stage, we believe, be based on um, carbon dioxide measurements. Um, there are a number of different standards, but uh, from the discussions we've had in that group already, we think that Northern Ireland will probably go for the, 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 the reasonably standard one, which is 1,000 uh, CO2 parts per million. Um, as part of that work, I mean, again, we've been engaging with, with um, businesses uh, to, to understand what they're doing in, in the ventilation space as well. Uh, a lot of them are well advanced uh, and, and have fresh air ventilation in place. Um, some of the smaller ones have said that the, 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 the availability of, of better guidance uh, would, would be helpful for them. Uh, we hope that that phase one guidance will be available and will be published within the next sort of week to 10 days, uh, ideally by before the end of October. Uh, and then that group will move on to look at sector specific guidance, which will maybe get into more detail uh, around higher risk settings. Okay, thank you. So I'm going to go to members now, and I have at this point Jerry, Pam, Carol, and Paula indicating in that order. So I'll go to Jerry. Go ahead, Jerry. Little hall. You're welcome. Uh, thanks, uh, Elaine and, and Peter. Um, last week I requested um, some information around the modelling, um, and as the chair referred to, there's a link in the pack. Um, not for the want to try and I tried several times repeatedly and cannot get access to the link. Uh, kind of get it opened and um, like the chair kind of asked, uh, I don't know if it's general modeling or modeling which is specific to this change. And I think it is quite a significant change, uh, hence the reason for a request and more information. Um, it's about reducing social distancing at a time, you know, last week when cases were quite high, but also, you know, last the last number of days we're hearing about Delta Plus uh, variant. So I, I, I remain unconvinced uh, of um, the rationale of whether this uh, change is um, at the right time, whether it's safe. Um, and again, the, um, the information supplied is uh, inaccessible. Um, if that's just on my end, then um, 
that's that's my fault, but I, I believe it's it's wider than that. Um, so yeah, Chair, I, I just want to say that I, I think um, there's still uh, a gaping uh, hole in terms of providing the rationale for this change, and I feel that at this time, at least, uh, I certainly can't uh, can't support it. Thanks. Um, so. The, the modelling pages are, are, are working on the website, so I can only assume that either there was a problem with the, the link that was typed into the letter or, or, or how it's being accessed. So what, what I'll do is I'll send the link in an email to the clerk if that's acceptable, and, and that can be circulated, so which, which should help um, get access. So apologies for that. Um, just in terms of the modelling, whether it's specific for, for this change, the modelling um, isn't able to get into the granular detail of the impact of a specific change as such. Um, so the modelling is based on certain assumptions, and one of those assumptions is the impact on R of relaxations generally. Um, and it, it's not possible to say what the impact on R is going to be from one specific activity. Uh, so it is kind of just, and you, 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 uh, the, the, the scientists take a view of what the, the collective impact of, of relaxations is likely to be on R, and that's what the modelling is based on, and that's why there's the three scenarios depending on the assumptions. Okay, Jerry, checking back with you, is that? Yeah, that's me, Chair, thanks. Okay, thank you, Jerry. Um, going then to Pam, go ahead, Pam, please. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, um, Elaine and Peter, for your attendance at committee this morning. Um, I wanted to ask in around um, 283, which was uh, to ask how clear the legislation is um, in relation to the distinction between private, private gatherings and dwellings uh, and raid and house parties. Uh, I suppose that what I'm asking is, is there not, are there not going to be operational challenges for the police um, and other enforcement bodies in relation to this? I mean, how, how do they really differentiate between the two? Um, so essentially what we've done is removed the, the restrictions on, on private dwellings in, in the legislation. So the restriction that Put the restriction or the regulation that had the restrictions around private dwellings is deleted. Um, the, the large house parties and raves regulation was actually a separate one, so we've just not touched that. Um, and that then has the effect of putting a cap on th as 30. Um, a large part house party is defined as 30, and then a rave is with pulsing music in the background. Um, so, yes, enforcement isn't obviously going to probably be routine. I can't imagine police are, are going to be just going around and checking ra randomly in houses. Um, but it does give that enforcement ability if, if they do receive a report uh, that there is a large gathering that's over 30 in a household um, and or a rave taking place. So um, whilst it wouldn't be a routine, we wouldn't have any routine enforcement going on, it does still allow that enforcement action to be taken where the regulation is breached. That's great. Thank you for that, Carly. Okay, thank you, Pam. And Carol, go ahead, please. Yeah, so thank you. Um, I, look, I appreciate what you're saying in terms of the granular detail. However, when you, when you do try to get into looking at previous examples of modelling and then the easements that have been um, set out in these strategy rules or by the executive and then the strategy rules are made, there often isn't, um, they don't often correspond to each other um, and it's quite difficult to be frank. Um, but what the, the First Ministers did this week was publish a winter plan in terms of restrictions in the event of. Uh, I think the, the, the gaping hole is what is a Minister's winter plan? And we heard um, reports from the CSA on the media this morning talking about plans A and plans B. So I appreciate that you need to bring these strategy rules forward, but in absence of official information, um, I think it's it's not good enough, to be honest. So I just want to make a point, and then the other issue is the advice, Elaine, that go to the health minister, the PCM, that goes to the executive, is that correct? In this particular case, yes, it's not. It's not always the case. Um, but for the for the relaxations on the regulations, yes, that that is the case as far as I'm aware. So does the minister get the granular detail? Uh, in terms of 
in terms of sure follow up in terms of modeling Oh, well, all of the modeling goes to fully to the executive. So both the minister and the executive will see the modeling. I know, but is yes. it the granular detail or is it the modeling that we see on the links? It's that all the same. Yeah, it, it's all the same. It's not possible to model at a granular detail level. Um, so that there aren't any other models there. There's only the one. Okay. So there's really three scenarios in the event yeah. of any situation. Yeah. Um, okay. So what I'm asking is, are is the minister considering a fourth, given that the um, the event at uh, Delta Plus is there and possibly new variants? Um, will that model change depending on the veracity of any new variant? So the modeling um, is updated every Tuesday. So if, if say for, and I'm speaking hypothetically here, but say for example, that the new variant um, turns out to be more transmissible, then the assumptions will change for the modeling and that you will then assume that R is going to be higher. Um, so that would be reflected in the, any future modeling if that were to be the case. Thank you. If I could just um, briefly mention that the department's um, the, the Department of Health does do a winter plan for each year and it's done separately to the regulation. So there would be a team working on that. Um, so it's not published at this point, but uh, just to reassure to members that it does happen and it is happening this year. Yeah, uh, uh, Elaine, see, sorry, Chair, I, I assumed that, but the issue is that we've been told that there's a surge in the summer, that they're seeing the pressures from late July that would normally see in winter. We're now in late, we're now in autumn and we haven't seen anything and I think it's really critical that we do. Okay, thank you. Um, I don't see any other indications. Um, Paula's question relating to the travel reg, so I don't see any other members indicating. So I'll uh, thank both yourself, Elaine, and Peter for attending this morning and uh, addressing members' questions. And uh, we will go ahead now with our formal considerations. So thank you. Thank you. Okay. Okay, members. Um, have members any further issues they wish to raise in relation to any of those SRs? No, okay, members, I'm going to move then to the both SRs in turn. Can I remind you that both of them are subject to the confirmatory procedure and that the examiner of statutory rules has no comments to make? I refer members to the clerk's memo at page 60 of the pack and to the other SR papers at tab at pages 62 to 66. So um, SR 2021-276, have members any further issues to raise in relation to this SR? If not, can I ask members to agree formally that the Committee for Health has considered SR 2021-276, the Health Protection Coronavirus Restrictions Regulations 2021, Amendment Number 16, Regulations NA 2021, and recommends that it be confirmed by the Assembly. Are we agreed? Agreed. Thank you, members. Um, item 6 is SR 2021 forward slash 283. I refer members to the clerk's memo at page 60 of the pack and to the other SR papers at pages 68 to 77. So in relation to SR 2021 forward slash 283, do members have any further issues to raise in relation to this SR? And if not, then can I ask members to agree formally that the Committee for Health has considered SR 2021 forward slash 283, the Health Protection Coronavirus Restrictions Regulations NA 2021, Amendment Number 17, Regulations 2021, and recommends that it be confirmed by the Assembly. Are we agreed? Agreed. Thank you, members. Members, we now have two further SRs to consider relating to travel restrictions, one of which was deferred from last week. I refer members to the clerk's memo at page 79. Departmental officials are here to brief the committee on the provisions of the regulations. So I'd now like to welcome um, Ms. Carol Picton Linus, who is head of Health Protection Branch 3. Can you hear us okay, Carol? Good morning, Chair. Yes, I can. Thank you. Yep, we're hearing you and seeing you clear, Carol. Thank you. And Mrs. Deborah Sharp, who is Deputy Head of Health Protection Branch 3. Can you hear us there okay, Debbie? Yes, I can, Chair. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, good morning to both of you and thank you for your attendance. I would like to go ahead and invite you to brief the meeting and then we'll go to members' questions. Thank you. 
Thank you, Chair. I, I will be providing the briefing this morning. Thank you. Okay, so thank you very much for your invitation to attend today's meeting of the committee. Um, the committee is considering two statutory rules which have been made to generally underpin early executive decisions taken in relation to international travel at its meetings during July to October 2021. The suite of regulations for consideration today are SR 2021 number 282 and SR 2021 284. This suite of regulations underpin the executive's agreement to align with the UK government and other devolved administrations in relation to the introduction of a new global travel task force framework, as well as other relaxation of border measures in relation to international travel and the three weekly cyclical review of countries, the outcome of which takes into consideration detailed analysis of risk undertaken by the Joint Biosecurity Centre. If the committee is content, I will briefly summarise each set of regulations in the order in which they were made. So the first set of regulations is SR 2021 number 282, and these are the Health Protection, Health Coronavirus, International Travel, Operator Liability and Information to Passengers Amendment number 8 regulations, Northern Ireland 2021. And these regulations came into operation on the 11th of October 2021. These regulations made, made changes to the Health Protection, Coronavirus, International Travel regulations 2021 and the Health Protection, Coronavirus, International Travel, Operator Liability and Information to Passengers regulations 2021. Primarily, these regulations were made to remove all countries off the red list, excepting Peru, Ecuador, Colombia, Panama, Dominican Republic, Haiti, and Venezuela. They also rolled out the fully vaccinated policy to a further 38 countries, which were Albania, Bahamas, Bangladesh, Bosnia and Herzegovina, Egypt, Ghana, Grenada, Hong Kong, India, Jamaica, Jordan, Kenya, Kosovo, Maldives, Moldova, Morocco, Nigeria, North Macedonia, Oman, Pakistan, Serbia, St. Kitts and, and Nevis, St. Lucia, St. Vincent and the Grenadines, Turkey, Ukraine, United Nations and Vietnam, Brazil, Chile, Colombia, Georgia, Indonesia, Montenegro, Namibia, the Philippines, South Africa and Thailand. They, um, they expand the rollout of the fully vaccinated policy to travellers who have been fully vaccinated for at least 14 days with a full course of the Oxford AstraZeneca, Pfizer, BioNTech, Moderna and Janssen va vaccines from a relevant public health body. They also, uh, the regulations also expands the fully vaccinated policy to those who have been vaccinated under the United Nations vaccination programme. The regulations also enables the EU Digital COVID Certificate app to be used to demonstrate a negative pre-departure test status for EU arrivals. And in effect, the EU Digital COVID Certificate is a means of demonstrating both vaccination and test status. This means that some Europeans who are not captured by the fully vaccinated policy are finding it difficult to provide proof of a negative pre-departure test unless they use the EU DCC app. To avoid an outcome where passengers are denied boarding, we wanted to make provision in the travel regs to allow the EU DCC app to be used for demonstrating proof of negative PDT, pre-departure testing. Regulations also fix a loophole that technically implies that from the 4th of October, anyone vaccinated in the US with either a CD card or a state-issued certification solution will be eligible to be treated as fully vaccinated, likewise for the various European countries that use the EU DCC app. The regulations also introduced uh, new critical exemptions, and these included um, an exemption in relation to non-UK police officers. It's an exemption from managed quarantine and self-isolation requirements applying to police officers of a foreign government arriving from both non-red and red list countries who are required to travel to Northern Ireland to undertake policing activity that is essential to their government. We also introduced a uh, critical exemption in relation to seasonal poultry workers, and this is an exemption to cover specified activities relating to the catching, slaughtering and processing of poultry for the 2021 Christmas market, applying to individuals from non-red non list countries. The countries from where these workers arrive have both low vaccination rates and for those that have been vaccinated have used vaccines not authorised in the UK. It is expected that most of these workers will arrive in October and November and that such workers must have proof of, of an offer of employment for seasonal work to carry out specified specific activities in poultry process, processing on a named farm when arriving in the country. We've also made technical amendments to the existing ex exemptions in respect of film and high-end TV production. Whilst there is currently an exemption within the ANI Northern Ireland International Travel Regulations for Essential Film and High-End TV Workers, there is an amendment to that exemption to allow international cast and crew not covered by the fully vaccinated policy to arrive into Northern Ireland to work on eligible productions. This exemption is from self-isolation only, is expected to cover young cast and crew who are yet to be fully vaccinated, and in part is less restrictive than the current exemption in terms of sponsorship required from NI Screen. 
We also made a technical amendment to the foreign diplomat exemption. The current exemption requires written confirmation that the individual is, in, is undertaking essential work for their mission, and it does not apply to dependents. This amendment would be that all, depend, all diplomats accredited in the UK and their dependents arriving from non-red list countries would be automatically exempt from self-isolation. If, if committees contend, I'll move on to the next set of regulations, SR 2021, number 284, and they are the Health Protection Coronavirus International Travel 2021 Consolidation Amendment number 7 regulations, Northern Ireland 2021, and they came into operation on the 15th of October. And these regulations made changes to the Health Protection Coronavirus International Travel Regulations 2021, and these regulations were made to uh, include seasonal poultry workers in the requirement to undertake workforce tests, uh, to remove the requirement from a passenger's, for a passenger seat number to be recorded on the passenger locator form. They amend Schedule 4 to the principal regulations to fix a typolog typological error in paragraph 7.3 in relation to the diplomat exemption, and they introduce a new exempt category for performing art, arts professionals who can claim an exemption from self-isolation whilst undertaking the exempt activity. So that's those sets of regulations, Chair. I trust that's been helpful. And Debbie and I are happy to take any questions that members may have in relation to those. Thank you. OK, thank you, Carol. And I'm going then, first of all, to our Deputy Chair, Pam Cameron. Go ahead, Pam, please. Thank you, Chair. And um, thank you to uh, Carol and Debbie for your attendance this morning. I wanted to ask just a couple of questions. It was, it's good to see that the focus on ensuring that the seasonal poultry workers are treated fairly and, and sensibly, um, given the importance of food production and concerns raised by the agri-food sector in respect of, of labour shortages. Um, could you tell us what discussions the Department of Health officials have had with the agri-food sector representatives in relation to the barriers facing temporary migrant workers. So that's my first question. And then I was wanting to ask if uh, you can provide an assessment of the current operation of the digit COVID, uh, digital COVID certificate, please. Okay, so in terms of the uh, discussions with the agri-food agri agri sector, <laughs> apologies. Um, we, we uh, in terms of how these exemptions um, are applied in travel regulations, we, we receive uh, a request from um, Dearer, uh, in terms of, of um, applying exemptions to certain groups of, of workers. And these are based on um, exemptions that have been considered in the UK government as well. So they would have had um, exempt, they would have had discussions with the agri-food agri sector there um, to, to see whether or not there is a requirement to uh, for these workers to come in. And also there's a link, link with the visa applications as well, in terms of allowing um, additional uh, workers from the, um, Europe and other areas to come into the country. Um, so those discussions would have been uh, undertaken with the relevant um, DERA or DEFRA departments, and it's at that point that the application is made to the Department of Health, who um, looks at the risk associated with uh, allowing um, various people to come into the country. And so these exemptions are, are um, greatly scrutinised in terms of public health risk and what mitigations will be put in place. So, for example, it, it would be the requirement to self-isolate, um, but only to be allowed to leave self-isolation when they're travelling to and from the place of work. Um, so that's how that exemption process works. Does that answer your question, Pam? Okay. Yes, that's Thank you. And then your second question was in relation to the digital app. Can you sort of repeat yes, that question for me, please? Yeah, it was just if you could provide an assessment um, of the current operation of the digital COVID um, certificate. The COVID cert app and I, the Northern Ireland one. Um, yeah, well, that that obviously can be used for uh, international travel. And what that currently does, it provides proof of vaccination for residents in Northern Ireland to enable them to travel abroad and to enter back into Northern Ireland. Um, so, if they have got the proof of vaccination on the on the app, which displays the QR codes, um, which is a proof of the fact that they've had two doses of a particular vaccination, that will enable them to arrive back into Northern Ireland and not to have. And there'll be no requirement on them to undertake day eight testing and self-isolation. Similarly, there is there are other apps in Europe, the EU DCC app, which will allow European travellers to enter into the UK along the same lines. Okay, and are you content that's um, operating well? Well, obviously that is something for the digital um, the digital team to comment on, but uh, so far, um, you know, the, it's been proven to be an effective means of proof of uh, vaccination for uh, in, to enable NI residents to, to return back to the UK. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Chair. Thank you. 
Thank you. And Carol, if I can ask before I come to Paula there, if I can ask in relation to the alert system that operates around travel. So how do you link into, I presume there is a global alert system to flag up potential variants of concern or areas of high transmission. <coughs> so how do you link into that and what is, what is the lead time or the lag time in relation to responding to a variants of concern around the world or indeed variants of concern that uh, we are hearing now in, in recent hours around a uh, potentially Delta Plus being a variant of concern and I do okay. note I, th I think I think I'm right in saying that uh, Britain has been added to Morocco's red list in, 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 the, in terms of the level of transmission so how does that system function and how do we link into it okay well um, the the UK government have uh, have a have access to the Joint Biosecurity Centre data. That's linked. Uh, that is a body within the um, UK Health and so the UK HSA, which was formerly PHE. Um, and the um, UK government um, look at the uh, assessment undertaken by the Joint Biosecurity Assessment, um, which gives um, it's an assessment of the data of all the countries in the world in terms of the epidemiology of the of the. Uh, virus in each of the countries and also on the the types of variants and any variants of concern or variants of interest um, and this data is shared with government ministers on a regular basis um, it's it's it underpins sort of it provides a risk assessment of the data that the joint biosecurity center looks at within each country so they would look at things like the the vaccination program and the genome sequencing processes within each country uh, to see whether or not they can give a, a risk assessment on safety if you like for allowing these travelers to come into the uk um, so they give an assessment on the uh, on the data that they they, they scrutinize and also a, an assessment on the confidence in the data that they're analyzing so this this assessment comes to the covid o committee um, in in the cabinet office uh, who reviews it reviews this on a three weekly cycle da ministers are cited into this and and are invited to these meetings on a three weekly basis to um, make a decision on the based on the assessment of the joint biosecurity council so where you have a, a, a concern about a particular variant within a country then obviously that country then would be the steps will be taken to remove to remove the ability for travelers to enter into the uk um, so uh, obviously, we don't wait just for the three weeks. If, if a variant of concern um, emerges before that, then obviously the COVID-O committee would take actions to remove that particular country from, from the, the list of countries that we allow to enter into the uh, country. And who from here attends that committee and what status do they have within it? Okay, so Minister, Minister of Health attends that committee. Um, and uh, officials in the department um, liaise with cabinet office officials in relation to having access early sight to those assessments. And the assessment then is discussed in the Department of Health with the, um, with the chief medical officer and the chief scientific advisor. And both officials and the CMO and the CSA provide a, a information and advice to minister who then attends the COVID-19 committee and can either agree or not to agree um, with decisions made at cabinet office level. But to date, but to date um, it's, it's our minister and the other devolved administra administration ministers who attend that as well. And do those devolved, and, and, and again, that's the critical point of us, that we do have a fully devolved health system. Do those devolved ministers have a vote in that, in that uh, decision-making process? Yes, yes. So in terms of the UK government may decide to um, extend or contract the, the list of countries, and our minister can decide whether or not to align with the UK government decision. Okay, and uh, finally on that one, what's the rationale for three weekly cycle? With, with a fast moving virus like COVID-19, um, it would seem three weeks is, is potentially too long to, to impact. Um, I'm just wondering what's the rationale for a three weekly cycle? Um, I, I think that was just that, that was a process that was agreed earlier on in the year, um, and obviously, as I said before, if if uh, there is a, I mean, that's just sort of the me mechanics of getting the uh, decisions and the assessments made, and obviously um, getting any operational matters lined up and any regulatory changes to incorporate any uh, assessment and any agreements on the countries. But obviously, if there is. The cabinet office will not wait three weeks if they if they consider oh there there is an assessment that there is a variant of concern or there is there is an immediate decision decision needed to remove a country from a particular list, um, so that that pro, that process is in place for that to happen. Okay, thank you. I'll go then to Paula. Go ahead, Paula, please. 
Um, thank you, Chair. Thank you, Patrick. Um, uh, two sort of straightforward questions. The first one relates to the uh, day two test. In England, they've moved to a PCR test uh, on day two. Or sorry, from a PCR to a level flow. When are, when's that going to happen here in Northern Ireland? Well, well, that's obviously a, a decision for the executive. Um, England have made the announcement that they would be moving fr from day two PCR testing to day two LFD testing and co mandatory confirmatory PCR testing, and that's coming in, I understand, on the 22nd of October. Um, other devolved administrations are considering whether or not to align, and obviously we will be making our own decision based on um, any public health risks. So that is a decision for the executive. So. Um, you know, as on, as on when um, the executive made that decision, um, that's subject to um, various considerations. So one would be, for example, we would need to ensure that the, um, if we were minded to align, that there would be a sufficient market of private providers that will enable um, LFD tests to be delivered to clients in, in Northern Ireland. But that's a decision for the executive. Okay, thank you. Um, I, I suppose I'm getting a lot of emails from constituents who are going away <laughs> for the Halloween break, so I think a bit of a panic on. Um, the second one is in relation to children who are 12 plus, who obviously haven't been vaccinated, um, but are travelling with, with parents who are being vaccinated. Do they, are, do they require a test upon return? So any, any UK resident um, who is... Um, any UK resident, any child under the age of 18, um, when they are travelling back to Northern Ireland, are deemed to be fully vaccinated for the purpose of the regulations, and as such, then will be exempt from um, from pre-departure testing and the uh, requirement to self-isolate. They will still, however, have to do undertake a day two PCR test. Okay, thank you so much. That was very helpful. No problem. Thank you. Okay, um, Colin, go ahead, please. Thank you. Um, just a quick question, and it's probably a really blindingly obvious answer, but I just haven't seen it, and I just want to double check. In terms of those exemptions for staff, for example, that are working in the agri food sector and the diplomats and police officers, the, is it just an exemption from the self isolation? Are they still required somewhere on some other rule to prove that they're vaccinated before they travel here? So these exemptions um, will apply to those who are not vaccinated. Um, so um, anyone who is fully vaccinated and can prove their vaccination status won't need the exemption in, in the sense that they will be able to arrive into the Nor Northern Ireland and be exempt from self-isolation. So these these exemptions are for the ones who, um, who would um, not have access to vaccine or they have not been fully vaccinated. Okay. That's probably the worrying answer that I wasn't looking for. <laughs> that I wasn't looking for. So essentially, the, the, these regulations just throw open the door for non-vaccinated people to come in to the Northern Ireland. No, I mean they, they, when when we say they're exempt from self isolation, it's only sorry I should have made myself clear. It's only in relation to being exempt from self isolation when they are undertaking the work from which they are they come into the country to do. At all other times, they have to self isolate. So, uh, so for example, the the farm, the you know seasonal poultry workers, they will be able to leave their place of self isolation to travel to to the farm to do the work, and then they they will return to their place of isolation and be required to self isolate at all other times. They'll also be required to undertake LFD testing on days two, two, five, and eight, and report those um, tests as well. So we can pick up if, if there is any infection, that if any positive results, then obviously they would definitely be uh, required to self-isolate and wouldn't be allowed to leave the um, place of isolation if they tested positive. Okay. Is there any program within the department to offer these people vaccinations if maybe there was a, a difficulty from where they were coming from and accessing it that that they could get? offered sort of relatively quick access to vaccination which provides the protection rather than because if we think back last year to places like australia new zealand where they were they were very successful because there were islands and they were able to control the virus from coming in and out of their their, their borders but yet this is providing an exemption that says if you're not vaccinated come on ahead and and, and you know just to, to help well, that well I, I think i don't think we're saying come on ahead um obviously it's um we, we would sincerely hope that with the further rollout of vaccination um, you're across the world, um, you, the numbers of people coming in under this exemption should be relatively small. Um, in terms of being offered the vaccination whilst they're here, I'm not sure um, I could answer that question. That would be, that would probably be sitting with the vaccination colleagues. Okay, I'll just I'll end by saying politely, if you throw open the door and you say that you're relaxing the right the regulations, you are saying come on ahead. But I'll leave it there. Thank you, Chair. 
Okay, thank you. And I don't have any other indications from members of questions. I'll just uh, take a pause to check, but no, I don't see any other members indicating in relation to this section. So, Carol and Debbie, I'd like to thank you both for attending this morning and for your briefing and your answers to, uh, to members. Thank you. And we can go ahead now with the individual consideration. Thank and, you. And you can, you can, uh, we can let you go. Thank you, Carol. Thank you very much. Okay. Okay, members, we now consider each of the SRs in turn. Both SRs are subject to negative resolution. Uh, firstly, SR 2021-1282. I refer members to papers at pages 81 to 87 of your pack. The examiner has reported that this SR is in breach of the 21-day rule, but she is content with the department's explanation for that. Have members any further issues they wish to raise in relation to this SR? Neil, thank you. Um, if not, then can I ask members to agree formally that the Committee for Health has considered SR 2021 forward slash 282, the Health Protection, Coronavirus, International Travel, Operator Liability and Information to Passengers, Amendment No. 8, Regulations NA 2021, and has no objection to the rule. Are we agreed? Agreed. Thank you, members. Moving on to the second SR in this section, SR 2021 forward slash 284. I refer members to your papers at pages 89 to 92 of your pack. The examiner has not yet reported on this SR. Have members any further issues that want to raise in relation to that SR? Chair, can I just note that little concern that I have that you know we're requesting all people from here that travel abroad and come back to make sure that they're vaccinated and requiring that and that this is just allowing non-vaccinated people to travel in and out but I understand the need for it but I just want to flag up that I'm unhappy about the fact that they're that, that we're throwing open unvaccinated access um so just just to denote it rather than make any point of it okay thank you and a uh then can I ask members to agree formally that the Committee for Health has considered SR 2021 forward slash 284, the Health Protection, Coronavirus, International Travel, 2021 Consolidation, Amendment No. 7, Regulations NA 2021, and subject to the report of the Examiner of Statutory Rules, has no objection to the rule. Are we agreed? Agreed. Thank you, members. Moving on then, item members to item 10. Um, which is the Coronavirus Act Extension of Powers to Act for the Protection of Public Health, NA Order 2021. I refer members here to the paper at pages 94 to 97 of your pack. The paper from the Department advises that it is proposing to bring forward a rule before Christmas to extend Section 48 of the Coronavirus Act for another six months, from the 24th of March 2022 to the 24th of September 2022. These powers are currently being used to make amendments to the health protection regs for restrictions, wearing of face coverings and travel, so those regs that we're, we're dealing with on a regular basis. Do members wish to schedule a briefing on this proposed rule? Yeah, members agreed. Okay, members, thank you. Before I move on to item 11, the Health and Social Care Bill, I'm going to take a short break there. So if we could uh, come back at a quarter to, about a six or seven minute break, and back for 10.45, please. Thank you. Okay, thank you, members. We will resume there at item 11, which is the Health and Social Care Bill, consideration of amendments. So this is an additional item to today's agenda, members. Department officials are here to brief members on the Department's proposed amendments. The Committee has previously agreed its own amendments to the HSE Bill, but agreed to consider that the Department's proposed amendments once they became available. I refer members to pages 121 to 130 of table papers, which provides members with a copy of the Department's proposed amendments. At page 131 then of your table pack, there is a copy of the Committee's agreed amendments to the HSE Bill for reference. So I would now like to welcome to this morning's meeting Mr John Miller, who is Head of Health and Social Care Board Closure Project Branch. John, are you able to hear us OK? I'm uh, uh, actually uh, responsible for the bill team. Okay, thank you, John. So, John Miller then from the bill team, and we're also joined by Alan Chapman, uh, who is Future Planning Model Planning Team Lead. Is that correct, Alan, and can you hear us? Uh, yes, Chair, I can hear you. Good morning. Okay, thank you. 
So uh, I'll go back to yourselves then and ask you to um, brief the committee then on the amendments that you have brought forward. And, and uh, thank you for doing that. And uh, we're looking forward to your briefing. So go ahead then, either John or Alan. Which of you are leading off? Uh, Chair, it's myself, and then Alan will uh, join in. Um, thank you for the opportunity to provide this briefing uh, in respect of the amendments to the Health and Social Care Bill. Um, I hope the information provided by the Minister prior to today's session proved useful. The Minister's letter included the attachments detailing proposed amendments to the Health and Social Care Bill. The amendments were developed following the final evidence session both Alan and Martina Moore attended and following receipt of the Health Committee's scrutiny report. The Health Committee's report included the need for inclusion of legislative powers to place a duty on the Department to bring forward regulations on the new ICS model framework to include reporting mechanisms and retention of local commissioning groups until regulations are approved by the Assembly. We have been working with colleagues in the Office of Legislative Council to develop both suitable and necessary amendments to the Health and Social Care Bill. As previously stated, these were shared by the Minister. And for clarity purposes, I will refer to them as they are labelled in the Minister's letter. JA3 provides for the continuation of local commissioning groups beyond the closure of the Health and Social Care Board. JA4 provides for relevant sections of the 2009 Reform Act to be retained in relation to the continued local commissioning groups. In addition, it also maintains the Safeguarding Board's duty to advise local commissions groups in relation to safeguarding and promoting the welfare of children. GA1 provides a duty to establish local area bodies, and SA3 sets out the detail about the continued local commissioning groups. Our amendments, therefore, have focused on the continuation of local commissioning groups and the statutory duty to bring forward regulations for local area bodies the latter being a key component of the Integrated Care Board, should that be necessary, and a 12... And, sorry, I've lost my run here. Uh, uh, sorry, going back over that again. Our amendments, therefore, are focused on the continuation of local commissioning groups and a statutory duty to bring forward regulations for local area bodies, the latter being a very key component of the Integrated Care System that is currently being developed. Alan will provide further detail on this matter. In relation to the local commissioning groups, Clause GA3 preserves those groups. This clause will allow provision for the continuation of LCGs beyond the closure of the Health and Social Care Board. I should explain that on the closure of the Board, LCGs must become statutory bodies in their own right to continue, and they will remain in place until such time as the Department makes regulations in respect of area integrated partnership boards. For clarity, the Department can only make regulations to close the LCGs following progression through the Assembly via draft affirmative process of regs in relation to those area boards. Schedule SA3 sets out the detail about the continued LCGs. It includes provision to retain the LCGs functions and memberships as they currently are. Uh, provision to extend membership beyond an initial six months following the closure of the health and social care uh, boards, should that be necessary, and 12-month intervals thereafter. Provision to disqualify and replace LCG members in line with existing regulations. Necessary consequential and transitional provision to ensure existing references to LCGs in legislation are maintained and, where necessary, are extended to reflect its change of status from Committee of the Health and Social Care Board to a statutory body. And finally, powers of the Department to dissolve the continued LCGs. It is worth noting, highlighting again that this can only be done when the Department has made regulations regards area integrated partnership boards. I will now pass over to Alan, who will explain the provisions that are contained in the amendments in relation to the area integrated partnership boards. Thanks, John. Um, members and Chair, just given the context of the proposed departmental amendments, 
Uh, I'd like to take uh, the opportunity to briefly recap on the, the local area integrated partnership boards and their role within the integrated care system uh, model. Uh, area integrated partnership boards are at the core of the model that is currently, currently being developed. And as members are aware, the model will bring together partners from within health and social care, but also beyond, including partners in the voluntary and community sectors and local government, as well as others, to plan, manage and deliver services based on the identified needs of the population. As set out in the draft framework for the model, it's envisaged that there will be five local area integrated partnership boards established, one per health and social care trust area, in order to deliver against the EM at local levels. They will have responsibility for strategic local area planning and local delivery, guided by an overarching strategic outcomes framework set by the Minister in the Department of Health. The area integrated partnership boards will take into account the identified needs of their local population and will have a wide representation from constituent organisations. A targeted consultation in respect of the, the integrated care system draft framework was launched uh, on the 19th of July and closed last month uh, on 17th September. Analysis of the responses to that consultation is ongoing, but early indications are that the approach is broadly supported, with the majority of respondents agreeing that this is the right approach to adopt for Northern Ireland. In addition to the briefings, we provided the committee engagement both within the health and social care sector and other st stakeholders and interested parties has continued, and feedback from both the consultation and ongoing engagement is being considered and will inform the development and finalisation of the draft framework for the ICS model and ultimately the regulations to be developed under the statutory duty that is provided for in the proposed amendments. Uh, as John has noted, these regulations must be laid in the Assembly and will be subject to the draft affirmative procedure. In terms of the proposed amendment detailed in Clause JA1, this sets out the duty for the Department to establish bodies for local areas and, in essence, the area integrated partnership boards detailed within the draft framework. It also includes the high level functions, duties and responsibilities of the, the boards that may be prescribed in regulations and a power for the department to give directions and provide guidance to the boards. The proposed amendments have been drafted with the intention of ensuring that the power to make regulations adequately reflects the aims and objectives set out within the draft framework for the model and the continuing duties of the department as set out in the 2009 Health Truth Care Act. The proposed amendments have also been drafted following careful consideration of the existing provisions relating to local commissioning groups, uh, with the overarching aim of ensuring that they provide the required power, powers to support successful implementation of the new model, and which ensure a continued mechanism for secure local input and intelligence in the planning of services remains in statute. In summary, Chair, clauses one and two will contain the headline provisions about the dissolution of the board and the transfer of its functions. New clauses JA3 and JA1 will form an addendum about local involvement in health, and existing clauses 3 to 7 will contain supplementary provision. Uh, we hope members have found this useful and we're happy to take questions. Okay, thank you, Alan, and thank you, John. Um, and I suppose um, there, there are a number of uh, amendments, and, and, and that, that, that's welcome. The main difference would seem to me to be in respect of the new clause 1A. Uh, in, in regard to the regulations for the new model of health and social care. There does not appear to be an amendment from the Department that specifically addresses that as a whole, but there is an amendment in relation to the Area Integrated Partnership Boards, uh, which provides for one element of the model. So, What would your rationale be for having just addressed one element of that model, and why have you taken that approach? Thanks, Chair. Uh, yes, we, we used the Committee's proposed amendment to help develop what would be the most effective way to provide legislative provisions for the new model. Uh, advice from Council was quite clear that legislating for a model in the broader sense could prove difficult in terms of providing clarity, purpose and scope for the power to be proposed. And rather than providing a power to legislate for the model or, or a system per se, it was recommended that the power be focused on providing for the specific elements of the model that would need and would benefit from being placed in statute. Uh, when we worked through the process of considering the amendments for a new model, it became clear that the focus should be on the local level, given that this is where the model proposes to establish significant new structures and processes that are not currently explicitly set out in the legislation. The approach, our approach also links uh, the power directly to the policy framework um, for an integrated care system in Northern Ireland. On that basis, it was felt that focusing the provisions within the bill on a duty to develop the regulations for local area bodies was the most appropriate approach and ensured there would be no ambiguity around what the regulations may or may not include. And the regulations in local bodies will detail the roles and expectations of those involved, detail the relevant functions of the local bodies, 
and detail how the local bodies will operate and as a consequence how the broader model will be expected to operate given the legislative requirements that will now will underpin the local bodies through those regulations. Okay and um, so are, are you saying effectively that, that, that the council the, the, uh, uh, the council recommended that it was only possible or desirable to focus on one element? My concern I suppose would be is how that would then inter interact with the wider the wider framework, um, and I suppose one of the issues in particular is around the, the issue of the trusts being involved in commissioning, and therefore it would be, um, you could have a very robust uh, allied AIB, AIPB in place, but if it doesn't have the kind of uh, the authority or the status within the overall framework, then that, that could be diluted. So what's your views of that? You know, it was uh, within discussion with the the council. They they made it clear it would be very difficult to to create a power that didn't have a, a more solid grounding on what it is we're actually wanting to legislate for. Um, and at the risk of if it was just a power based around uh, the concept of a model, and um, that anything that would could happen that could change that model, then obviously the the power that we had been provided for would then apply, and you could see. It, Uncertainty arise whether uh, in, in six months or eight months or or something could could affect the change in the actual model itself that the, the regulations would no longer be fit for purpose, and that the the key would be to ensure that we provide clear regulations around specific elements of the model itself, including how you know uh, the the membership uh, of the the local area partnership boards, which would include uh, the local health and social care trusts. And that the functions that would apply directly onto those AIPBs would be clear in the regulations, um, and therefore would read across into how the how the trusts and the other partners all interact within the the system and within the planning and management and delivery of, of services at a local level. Okay, and you had referenced Alan um, primary legislation, potential primary legislation. Is there an intention to bring primary legislation at a later date on some of these issues? I think our position would be that there's no outright intention to bring forward primary legislation, no date set. Or, uh, what we would uh, intend to do is, is bring forward the proposed amendments through the regulations, uh, and we think that would give a good ground in the statute for the model moving forward. What we will have to do is just uh, take cognizance of, of how the model develops, and should there be a need for primary legislation in the future, that, uh, that yes, of course, if that's required. Um, to give full effect to the model that we'll bring that forward in due course. But at this point in time, we don't know if that need will arise or if it was to arise when it might arise. Um, it will just take time to work through as we develop the model. Uh, obviously, there's a, a significant amount of more detail still to be worked out. Uh, and as we get the model into the implementation phase, we'll be able to determine whether there's any, any additional need for, for primary legislation moving forward. Okay, thank you. And uh, the final one from me then before I go to Colin and then Carol. Um, having seen the committee amendments now, how do your amendments differ and do you feel that they address all the points or can you outline where the, where the two different sets differ and, and why that has been taken? And I think uh, we've, we've covered off uh, in terms of the, the specific um, Amendment in terms of the committee's amendment in terms of the model as a whole, and our amendment in terms of focusing down to the local level. Um, and I think they they do differ, but uh, hopefully I've set out the the rationale and reasoning for that. Um, and I think in terms of the local commissioning groups, uh, our amendments essentially uh, to just work through the detail of retaining the the existing um, provisions and moving those across into a setting that will continue to allow the commissioning groups to operate um, as they currently do. Um, and the only difference possibly is that we've, we've worked through some of the, the broader detail from the, the own local commissioning groups uh, regulations uh, and included those in, in the proposed amendments at the stage. Um, but it essentially gives uh, the same effect uh, as the committee's amendments in terms of it retains the LCGs and uh, they can't be closed down until such time as we've brought forward the regulations in relation to the integrated care system model, specifically the area integrated partnership boards, and that those are uh, to be done through the draft the process, uh, and the LCGs can't be closed or dissolved until such time as that's been agreed by the Assembly. 
Okay, thank you. And, and I do want to welcome the, you know, the, the work that has gone into that. I think the committee would, would generally welcome the fact that the LCGs have been now protected on a statutory footing and that there will be an opportunity for the Assembly to look at, at at least that element that, that we have discussed and we can see how, uh, how, we, how we feel about that uh, more fully when we get a, a better chance to consider uh, the amendments that you have put forward to us. But for now, I am going to go then to members. So I am going to Colin and then I am going to go to Carol on the, on the video. So Colin, go ahead, please. Thank you very much, Chair. And apologies if some of these questions are a bit more basic because I have just rejoined the committee today. So some of this may have been explored previously. But um, just in terms of, I mean, given that the sort of move to, to, rem, to sort of wind down the Health and Social Care Board was because there were too many organisations within health uh, and there was, they were pulling in different directions in different ways. And notwithstanding that it's a, it's critical and important that there's a local voice involved in this, does turning these the LCGs into statutory uh, some sort of statutory fit, does that turn them into separate organisations that we're actually increasing the number of, of organisations and that we have rather than decreasing it? Um, and maybe alongside that, like how, how long do you think it's going to take before the uh, area integrated partnership boards will be up and running? Because it would have been, I suppose, ideal that they were up and running on day one whenever the board wound down. So what, what's what been the delay in getting them into place? And, and is it a case that the LCGs couldn't just become AIPBs overnight and then just move on to it? And so maybe just some, some in that vein, please. Colin, if I, if I could take the first bit on LCGs. Um, LCGs already exist, so therefore we're not actually creating uh, new bodies. If you see what I mean, uh, those committees are already there. The uh, statutory basis of those body of LCGs has to change because they were committees of the board. The board will close, uh, and that statutory basis will no longer exist. Um, in terms of LCGs, um, uh, without going through the whole part of the history of the, of the various briefings committees, um, it, uh, our, our initial position was that. Um, LCGs were part of a commissioning system that, that didn't work. So our, our initial position was that uh, LCGs should go. Uh, the view remains that uh, the area integrated, uh, the area bodies, uh, will be an improvement on the on the current commissioning system. Okay. Uh, thanks, John. If, if you don't mind, I come in as well. Um, in terms of the time frame, yeah, initially, obviously, go, not. Not to go over the previous briefings either, but our initial position was that we continue and we do this um, and develop the integrated care system model and the, the, the parts of that, including the area integrated partnership boards, on a policy basis rather than a legislative one. Uh, we would have uh, worked towards the intention of having those in place uh, at the 1st of April uh, to align with the closure of the health and social care board. Uh, obviously, the, you, you know we understand the, the position of the committee have, have come forth with it, that they need to uh, have the assurances that the local input and intelligence and the planning processes is maintained within uh, a legislative basis. In order to do that um, and, and produce the regulations, then for the likes of the area integrated partnership boards, that'll take a little bit of time to develop. Um, obviously, with the, the the end of the mandate approaching as well, it, it's just not possible. Um, to progress the bill through in order to provide us the legislative powers to develop the regulations and then subsequently get the regulations through in such a short period of time. So on that basis, there will, will put a, a bit of a difference in the time frame for when we are able to bring through our integrated partnership boards. But whenever the, whatever the proposed amendments are that are agreed, we'll, we'll then start to work at that now uh, and put in place and develop whatever the regulations should be um, in advance and in preparation for whenever we're in a position to bring them forth to the Assembly as, as early as possible. Um, just to reassure, there's, there's no intention to, to continue LCGs indefinitely. Um, we've been clear in the position that uh, you know, whilst, whilst LCGs have done a, a lot of good work and have provided us a strong foundations to build from, uh, the integrated care system model is, is looking to move us in, in, in a different direction and, and um, we believe that, uh, touching on your last point there, um, that the sound base of the LCGs have given us, um, we have considered uh, and you know looked at and we've looked at their provisions and everything involved with that and what they've done, but we feel it's important that we make that step 
uh, change uh, and bring forward new regulations for the area integrated partnership boards to signal that this is a different way of doing our planning and managing delivering services. And it will help to reinforce and support necessary changes that we need to put not just in practice but also in terms of our culture and behaviours um, and to signal that this is something different. Um, and uh, hopefully that's a helpful explanation of your points. Okay, yeah, I mean, and maybe just to clarify, I actually sat on an LCG at a point in time, so I know what they are. I'm just, I was just wondering about um, how, you know, the, the, the requirement for them to have some sort of statutory footing, but I get the point that if the board goes, then they need a statutory home to belong to, so that needs to transfer across as well. Um, but I just worry that, um, you know, and it's not your depart your side of the department, it will be another side that will need to move quickly with these, because we're going to have LCGs that are not coterminous with the Area Integrated Partnership Board, some of which are in existence and delivering. And I think what's, what's happening is that that sort of um, landscape out there for commissioning of services is going to get more complicated in the short term rather than less complicated, which was probably the purpose behind removing the Health and Social Care Board. So um, I appreciate you have a tough task trying to legislate for all of that, but thank you, Chair. Thank you, Colin. So, uh Anish Charlie Cullen, Kashtana Gorai Carl, Bill Kashtana Hall. Yeah, so thank you, um, John, and thank you, Alan, for your um, presentation. And indeed, I welcome the work of the Bills team here in trying to formalise uh, or even formulate um, a potential amendments and then the work that the department has taken on board in relation to listening to the committee. No one wants any um, ambiguity about the role of commissioning, um, but the issue was that the integrated partnerships and other um, acronyms weren't in a position, you know, even after the potential dissolution of health and social care, and commission was a big issue for the committee, particularly given the fact that the department has consistently failed to bring forward how uh, they're going to tackle inequalities around health and social care. Um, and the other, you know, from my point of view, because I've been persistent in this, as has other members, um, that um, given all that power to the department at this stage, um, in my opinion, just wasn't very democratic. So um, that's my rationale. I've worked with LCGs, I've worked with Community and Voluntary, and indeed health and social care and none of us want any cumbersome or over bureaucratic systems that it's like walking through treacle to get to the bottom of actually what you hope will be. But see, come back to the point that the chair column raised, particularly in relation to the need or the, the future need to bring forward legislation. So while we don't want LCGs to come continue forevermore, that's not the intention here. The intention is to amend it in order to make sure we're much fit. But in relation to the bill going through the passage in the assembly, I would be surprised if these questions aren't asked by other members who aren't on the health committee. So in relation to the potential need for further legislation or even amending regulations, I, I I would be asking um, at this stage, it needs to be a, almost a timeline or a draft of what will happen and when it will happen, um, because I think that's a reasonable ask, to be honest. And if it's not needed, a clear and more definitive response on why it may not be needed, because it's still very jargon based. Uh, in that but I just want to put on record appreciation that the department has listened to the concerns of the committee um, and indeed the way the community out there. So thank you, Chair. Thank you. Yeah. Um, and any other questions from members at this point in time? Um, no. Okay. Well, listen, um, John and Alan, thank you for coming along and for that, that work that has gone in. Um, and we will we will take a closer look and sort of see 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 where we are at or where we go. But we want to, I think it's it's welcome that we have those amendments which are are largely doing much of what the committee had uh, raised concerns around. So thank you for that, uh, John and Alan. I can let you both go and uh, take care. So members, thank you, thank you. yeah, thank you, John, and thank you, Alan.
Um, members, I was wondering there, could we I suggest maybe ask the bill clerk just to, to, or the clerk of our own committee to work with the bill clerk to outline the key differences in the two sets of amendments, just so we have a, a, a sort of a ready read comparator? Would members be content with that? Just so we can get a side by side look at, at, at the, the, two, the, two different, the two different drafts, if you like, and where they differ. Okay, members, um, thank you for that. Any other issues in relation to that item, members, before we move on? No? Okay, thank you. Okay, members, so uh, we're now moving into our deliberations on the Severe Fetal Impairment Abortion Amendment Bill, and we're going into the report deliberations in closed session. So if we could ask the clerk to press the button. We are now resuming at item 13 with the Severe Fetal Impairment Abortion Amendment Bill formal clause by clause consideration. The next item is our formal clause by clause of this uh, Severe Fetal Impairment Abortion Bill. I refer members to the papers at pages 98 to 110 of your pack. Do members wish to declare an interest before we, before we go into this? No, no, nothing from members. Thank you. Members, I will then proceed through the clauses and put the questions formally. May I advise members that where there are amendments, I will put the question on the amendment first. If there is not consensus on the question, I will ask members to vote through a show of hands and the clerk will confirm the results of each vote. So members, moving on to clause one, amendment of abortion on the grounds of disability. Is the committee content with clause one as drafted? No. Yes, Chair. No. Okay, so there's two different views there, so we are going to put that to a vote. So the vote will be um, on is the committee content with clause one as drafted? All those who are in agreement, raise their hands, please. Um, and that includes Jonathan. That includes Jonathan. Okay, so is the committee content with clause one as drafted? All those who do not agree? Please raise your hand. So that's Jerry and Paula. Yeah. Um, just, I just need to check before we go any further. Has has Alan um, been put off the meeting and, and not been able to rejoin, or I'm wondering what has what has happened there? Hasn't been on. Okay. Okay, members. So, Clerk. Uh, so just to confirm, I have Pam and Jonathan in favour of Clause 1, I have Jerry and Paula against Clause 1, and then the rest of the members aren't voting. Is that yeah. correct? Yeah. C can I maybe just, I I'll just be 100% honest, this is my first meeting and we're near the end of this process, so there's a lot of these issues I haven't been able to get the evidence on, so I'm going to just abstain today from these, but certainly we'll listen to them and we'll take a view in the chamber. But Okay. Um, so what is the outcome then, Clerk, in relation the, to The that? outcome is that the clause isn't supported um, because there's not a, um, a majority in favour of it. Um, so the next question then, Colm, is whether the committee wishes sure. to... Yes, go ahead, Pam. I just see Alan's in the audience. We'll bring him up. We'll bring him up and... Sure, I will not vote already, though. Clerk, what's your view of that? <laughs> no, I'm on the vote already, so surely we can have a vote again. I think, uh, Chair, certainly my advice is that there may have been an issue with Alan's, yeah. and therefore he wasn't um, able to get on, as opposed to had left. Yeah, given given the circumstances of of how that how we went out of the meeting and back in, I think to be fair, we should rerun that vote. To be quite honest, um, so I'm going to put the question again: Is the committee content with clause one as drafted? All those in favour, please raise your hand. Can't see Alan at the minute. Is the committee content with clause one? Is, is, is the committee content with clause one as drafted? All members in agreement, please raise your hand. Okay, so Pam. It's Pam. Yeah, okay. I don't see any indication from Alan there. And so. Uh, yep. Oh, here, let's, right there's there's an indication from Alan. Okay. Okay. All those. 
Uh, is the committee content with clause one as drafted? All those who disagree, please raise your hand. Jerry and Paula. And just to confirm again, the rest of the members aren't voting. Okay. Um, so th that the committee is content with clause one as drafted. Okay. Then there's uh, moving on then to clause two, which deals with the short title and commencement. The bill sponsor has proposed an amendment, members, to clause two, page one, line ten, to leave out force on the day on which this act receives and insert instead operation on the day after receiving. I refer members to page 21 of table papers. The committee was advised by the bill sponsor that this is a technical amendment to bring clarity to the commencement date. So um, I will now put the question, is the committee content with the proposed amendment? All those in favour, please raise your hand. Um, and Alan. And I will put the question again. Is the committee content? I'm yeah, I'm Jonathan, yeah. Yeah. Um, and I will put the question in again. Is the committee content with the proposed amendment? All those who do not agree, raise your hand. Paula and Jerry Clerk, I think. Yep. And again, just to confirm, those in favour were Pam, Jonathan and Alan. Those against were Jerry and Paula. And the rest of the members weren't voting. So the committee is content with the amendment. Yeah. So I then will move on to the question in relation to the. Do the uh, so. The committee then are uh, the clause as amended. So. The committee is. Let me see where I have this on the. Yes. Is the committee content with clause two? Subject to the proposed amendment, all those in, in agreement, please raise your hand. Okay, so that's yeah, so um, Paul, Pam for both your, Jonathan and Pam, and then Alan. And Alan. Yeah. And is the committee content with clause two, subject to the proposed amendment, all those against? Jerry and Paula. So those in favour were Pam, Jonathan and Alan. Those against were Jerry and Paula, and the rest of the members weren't voting. Yeah. So the committee is content with clause two subject to the proposed amendment. Yeah. Okay. Okay, members, thank you. And moving on then to item fourteen, which is correspondence. Um, I draw members' attention to correspondence at tab fourteen of your pack. Um, First of all, item 14.1 is a departmental response on vaccination uptake by ethnic minorities. Um, do members have any uh, issues they wish to raise? Carol, I see your hand raised there. Yeah, sure. And I want to come back to um, another issue under 14.11 and 14.9. In relation to the uptake by ethnic minorities, um, can we just find out what the situation is regarding asylum seekers and refugees and also the um, position around vaccination of the homeless as well because uh, I think it's really important getting into the critical period here. Yeah, members content that we seek that further information. Um, and, yeah. and, and I think when we're doing that we should seek a further update in terms of that very hard to reach group uh, and, and how progress is being made with with accessing and with providing vaccine to that grouping. And Paula, I think, was indicating, or was it Pam? Pam, sorry, go ahead, Pam. It's okay, Chair, thanks. No, I just in agreement with Carol there, and I think it's really important that we do get an update on this, um, because we want to be um, assured that everybody that is able to take a vaccine is, is offered that opportunity to get the vaccine, and if there are concerns around that, around that uh, that uptake, we would need to know what those concerns are. I think it's it's vital that everybody is offered that protection. Yep. Yeah. Are members content with that? Okay, members, moving on, and I'll come back to you on those other couple of items, Carol, but moving on then, the next one I want to raise, uh, draw attention to, is item 14.3, which is a written departmental briefing on continuing health care. 
Um, there are a number of issues around that, members, that I would suggest that we seek further information. First of all, the, the Minister has indicated that he is producing guidance on this area, and I think it would be useful if we could get the timeline for when that guidance would be available, if members agree. Yeah. I also think it would be uh, a useful juncture at which to get an uh, update from the Department in terms of timelines on the adult social care reform and consultations and all of those steps that are taking place. So I think we should ask for an update on timelines for the adult social care reform. Members content? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I would also like to request that, that we ask whether that, will, that adult social care will, will include a true cost of cure. It has been raised here committee many times from, from the very outset, but it's still not in place. But uh, if we can ask whether or not the plans at, at present include a, a through cost of cure. And finally, on, in terms of this, I would think that we should look for uh, information in relation to how claims for people who are disadvantaged by the previous uncertainty will be assessed, uh, or people who, as a result of not receiving the right advice, weren't able to access, I think we should seek a view from the Department as to how they're planning to ensure that no one is disadvantaged as a result of that. Members content with that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. So I see uh, Paula indicating she wants to come in on 14.5, which I'll, I'll come to when, that, when we arrive at that point. Um, item 14.3 is a written departmental briefing. No, sorry, that's the one I've just covered. Uh, item 14.5 then is a departmental response to issues raised regarding the inclusion of um, e-cigarettes and vaping in the smoke-free vehicles legislation. And just to remind yeah. members that we dealt with the, the, the purchasing of, of e-tobacco products and also we dealt with tobacco smoking in cars. So, uh, Paula, you have indicated you'd like to make a comment in relation to that. Um, thank you, Chair. Um, I, I think it's a wee bit disappointing, the response we got. Obviously, um, the Bill's Office and the Department's officials are, are very pressurised at the minute, but I do think that there's a missed opportunity for the regulations not to be amended at the same time that would um, preclude um, adults from vaping in cars where, where children are present. And I would say that the, the legal work behind the scenes in terms of getting the advice around that would not actually be that um, uh, far-reaching, I think. I just would like it to be noted. I think that it's disappointing that they can't include it at this time. Yeah, and I, I did raise the concern at, at the last meeting, and I thought it would be it would be relevant, um, and I think it would be useful if the department would prioritise seeking to establish whether that evidence exists or is emerging in in a, in a timely way to include to include that as part of the uh, as part of the the uh, bill potentially in the future or the, the legislation in the future, Colin. I, I really don't mean this is a, in a jokey sense, but it's seriously, sometimes the vape, and I don't know how people can see when they're driving, because the amount of smoke that is generated from them at times, especially if people have their windows down, you can see the amount of um, steam that's coming out, and there must be a danger in driving whenever they're, they're doing that, but definitely from the health perspective as well. Yeah. I would agree. Yeah. Okay, any other comments, members? I have a... Yeah, Pam, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. I don't disagree with Colin there either. Yeah, it baffles me as well, actually, how people can, can see when they're vaping, especially if their windows are closed. Um, but I suppose um, I would like to see that evidence coming forward, and we do have to be guided by the, by the evidence and by the scientific um, and medical evidence involved in this. It, I mean, I think for non-medical people, it would stand a sense that you would include these issues in, uh, as one, but we, we do need to have that evidence, so I'm, I'm happy that we do go back and look for a, a, an update. Chair, just in relation to 14.3, I was trying to get back in there uh, around the continuing health care, and it was just to say that I certainly wasn't um, satisfied with the response that we got. I think there wasn't um, enough in terms of answering the, the hard questions that were there, so I do support um, digging more into that um, and to making sure that we do get a proper full response to those issues because the, there is that outstanding concern that the single criteria has been introduced to effectively eliminate financial liability for continuing health care. So that it is a concern certainly for, for the DP and, and I would like to hear more on that issue. Yep. Okay. Thank you, Pam. So, um, Charles, you were looking in on item 14.9 first, and then we'll go to item 14.11. So, 14.9, Pam. 
Or sorry, Carol. No, Chair, it was actually, I've got my figures. It was 14.4 on the three year budget and setting process. Yep. Previously, the Minister said that they couldn't do a full quality impact assessment given an annual budget, despite the fact that the department itself, through its own screening exercise, showed up that there were major concerns and equality or qualities that were being were not being um, implemented. So I would argue that um, we need to write to ensure that that full AQIA process happens. The other issue, Chair, um, if you're just happy before, for just Carol, before, before, wait. Carol, sorry, before you move on, just just I want to just check that committee committee content with that. Do we seek that uh, that on, on equality screening? Yep, thank you. And go ahead then on the other one, Carol. So in relation to um, the Dr. Watt issue on, sorry, sorry, 14.11, opportunities for service user care representation, um, I, I'd like to see more um, detail on how this actually happens without throwing the word co-production and co-design in, um, given the fact that when you're talking about service users and cars, particularly cars, and the, the amount of burden that we're putting on them, um, unfunded. I think we just need to see what that looks like. So I'll, I'll, I'll just wait to see the, the committee's views before we move on to the doctor body issue. Yeah, and I think there is important work there for, and important considerations for ourselves as a committee in terms of how we engage and how we seek views and, and include and, and uh, include the public. And I think there's there's massive issues there around daycare and respite where it would be useful to have views and also cures and the pressure that they're under. I did meet with, with, uh, with Anne-Marie, uh, there was a, a correspondent who wrote in uh, in relation to this and I did meet with her and some very interesting information and something that I think will be very useful for us as a committee in due course to look back when we get some of the legislative pressures dealt with that we take a sort of a more strategic look at how we engage and how we scrutinise the engagement of the department and, and the arm's length bodies uh, that, that we're responsible for, because I think that is potentially a game changer and something that we need to get much better at um, and, and much much more effective at doing, um, and including the, what we're hearing from those engagements actually into the implementation of how things go forward. So, Carol, go ahead then on, on the other item that you were flagging. So, yeah, so, Chair, in relation to the ongoing Michael Watt issue, I appreciate that there's an agreement when it comes to the maximisation process of the inquiries processes that it isn't appropriate to you know make commentary um, on that report at that stage because there's still outstanding issues. However, and I understand some of that you know is in closed session. I, I I get that, but I do wish um, the committee to consider that beyond the technical issues and the protocol issues that the rest of the sessions in open, I think there's been too much. Um, there's been a lack of transparency around this whole process. Um, and I would like the committee or the, the public inquiry to be in front of the committee, as well as the GMC and the plain, patient plan council as well. Because I think given the severity and given the traumatization and the re-traumatization um, that is currently experienced, I think it's the least that we could do as a committee, to be honest. Yeah, and I think what we, we have obviously a very extensive schedule in terms of engagement around the neurology with a number of key um, bodies coming forward to brief the committee. So I think we can take a look then at that point as to where we need to take it from there, um, if committee members agree with that. Um, that will be taking place on the 4th of November, our first meeting back. Okay then, members, any other comments to make in relation to any other pieces of correspondence on the on the main pack? Colin, go ahead. Yeah, just I'm noticing there in uh, item 14.13 that there's a, a, a an email about the st static the statistics that are on the dashboard. Um, and I was just wondering, has has the committee received any presentation previously just on the one about a breakdown of those that are in hospital by vaccination status? Because I continue to think that, that uh, if we're trying to push out that message that we want as many people as possible to get vaccinated, if we have that daily evidence being updated of how many people are in hospital that are unvaccinated and how many are in ICU, 
that are unvaccinated? And, and if that hasn't, could we maybe write and ask the minister, is, is that something that could be considered? Because um, I think for all of us, from all political parties, it would be a very useful weapon to encourage people to be able to um, avail of, of vaccination. Yeah, yeah, and, and factually important for the public mm -hmm. as well. Yeah, that's why I think I think we should certainly write and, and see if that's if that's a, something that's possible or, or doable. And then just again, chair, under fourteen eighteen, there's a, a, a letter in about um, or if, uh, it's con from the. Um, let me just get age and I about access for GP services for older people. I know lots of older constituents that are, are concerned about access to GP services. We know that GPs are under a lot of stress and pressure. Uh, so there are two forces that are coming together. There are people wanting to be able to access their GPs and GPs under considerable pressure, but especially for older people that may not be able to engage with technology as well as other cohorts. Um, would there maybe be a way of taking what's um, suggested in there and maybe just getting an update from the department just for, for information? Yeah. Well, just to the, the, the flag up, we are currently waiting a response on access to GP services, but we can certainly forward that correspondence on to the department yeah. um, and see if there's any specific issues within that. Okay, that's good. Thank you. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Go ahead, Pam. Yeah, thank you, Jits, on that, and I would uh, agree with Colin on that. And the GP access, we know it's a massive issue, and we also know that from speaking to GPs um, and the representatives, that GPs are working incredibly hard and must be commended for for the work through this pandemic. But perception is very much that the GPs are closed, and uh, this is a very hard thing to um, to to get to grips with. But there's a huge issue around older people and access to technology and being able to use that technology because not everybody can sit and i've i've done it where i've had to be dialed 125 times to literally get um to a body at the other side of the to even talk about the chance to get an appointment or an actual face-to-face -face appointment so there are Serious issues, and I understand and appreciate that, that, that we have had the announcement of the 5.5 million um, investment to GP services to hopefully address that. But I'm not sure how quickly that will, you know, make an impact on, on those services. But I just think we we can't ignore the fact that for so many people out there, actually accessing GPs is incredibly difficult. Yeah, I, I agree. I have to say, and I have done. Uh, recently, a survey which has a large volume of responses and, and indicating problems. And I think key to all this, it, everything that, that continues to arise in health continues to go back to workforce. And that stalling of the rollout of the multidisciplinary teams is really, really regrettable and something that I think needs to be a total focus put on in terms of getting that additional support to GPs. And as well as that, and we have discussed it here in committee before as well, is the availability and the access to volunteer vaccinators. To provide what it looks like now being a separate booster and flu camp campaign, they're not going to be um, co-harmonious in that in that sense. Um, so I think it's it's crucial that we see as much support provided to GPs in that respect as well. But clearly, GP access is a major major issue of concern, no doubt about that. And GPs are, as you say, Pam, under tremendous pressure. But they're just they're just uh, struggling to to. Uh, to fulfil all the demands that are coming their way, so support is key. And I do welcome the, the announcement of the 5.5 million. I actually had been calling for that to be brought forward, and I do welcome the fact that winter pressure money has been brought forward uh, now at this point. Okay, members, any other comments in relation to table or in relation to the main pack papers before going to tabled? And are members therefore otherwise content with the actions as listed on the correspondence list? Yep. Thank you, members. Members, moving on then to table papers, I'll draw your attention to a couple of items. At page 25 of your table pack is a detailed response to questions raised during the departmental briefings on the Adoption and Children Bill. Um, so, do members have any comments at this point? And, and bear in mind, we will and we can consider this further in the coming weeks. But, do members have any issues they wish to raise at, at this point in time in relation to that? No, thank you. At page 86 of your table, pack then a copy of a research and information service paper on the Safe Access Zones Bill. Uh, there's a briefing from the researcher will be scheduled in the coming weeks. 
A copy of the paper will be published on the committee's web page, so just drawing that to members' attention. At page 115 of the table pack, there is a correspondence from the Department providing a copy of the Delegated Powers Memorandum in relation to the Organ and Tissue Donation Bill. So, are members content to forward that to the Examiner of Statutory Rules for her consideration? Yeah, members content. Thank you. Um, moving on to the forward work programme, then, members, at tab 15.1 of the table pack, um, are members content to note the forward work programme? Yeah, content. Thank you. And moving on then to any other business, and I have been indicated to me that Carol has an item of any other business. Go ahead, Carol, please. Yeah, um, so Chair, the, the issue around the £500 payment for workers is just still really persistent. We're all getting it, particularly for the domiciliary care workers in the independent sector, residential and care home workers. I mean, we're getting into Christmas here. These are low paid workers. Um, with really precarious um, conditions, and and I, you know, like we've consistently heard from the minister, there he's trying to get this sorted as soon as possible. But like it's just not on, to be honest. And I would like us to agree to write to get something more definitive because even meeting some of the domiciliary curb, it's just constantly coming up, you know. It just well, feeling just... Yeah, just for clarity, Carol, I had last week proposed that we do write, and that letter has been away and is issued to the department, asking for a definitive date to be provided to those workers. Sure. That's already away. Colin? Sure, if, if Carol was like happy enough for me to come in somewhat and support in that and maybe suggest, I, I know the time is tight, but I think if we write, you're just going to get that letter, which is the same answer that we get from the Minister in the House, which says, yeah, we're getting round to it. It's a very complex issue. I think we need to explain to people what the complexities are. Um, you know, these people can get public money from our Department of Health paid to do their work, but we're told that somehow or another there's a difficulty that they don't know who they are or how many hours they've worked, but yet we've already given them public money. There's a record that they have received public money for their pay, so it really should not be that difficult. But I do think that somebody needs to come and explain this, because I could probably give you the content of the letter that you'll get back now, and we'll be no further forward at the other end of that letter. So I don't know if there's a way of getting a 15 or 20 minute briefing at some stage from whoever it is in charge to actually tell us what the, those problems are and then if we see if there's a way of overcoming them. Yeah, and just yeah. To, again, I, yeah, thanks, Carol. Again, for, for clarity, the letter we have away is asking for a very specifically a definitive date. So I don't expect that letter to come back with, with the, although I do think, and I agree with you, Colin, that there is this area around what the complexities are. I have a written question in with the Minister asking him when he started this work mm -hmm. in terms of uh, establishing who this workforce were, because I would have presumed that would have started in January when the announcement was made. Um, but I, I await the answer, the, the answer to that response. But I think a briefing in terms of why this is particularly complex or why this complexity is delaying to such a degree one part of our staff and our frontline workforce from getting the payment where their, their colleagues have already received it. And I think that's, that it, it was clear from the start they would be entitled to it, and therefore I don't understand either why it's complex now. So I think we could and, and we should seek a, a briefing on what that complexity amounts to and how it's going to impact or, how, or why it wasn't addressed earlier in the process. Members content with that? Yep. Any other business members? Okay, members, thank you then. I'm going to move on to the date, time and place of next meeting. Um, our next meeting will be on... Just to say, it'll be on the 4th. We may need to meet a bit earlier, possibly 9 o'clock, depending on what organisations we have um, on the neurology um, issue. So, we, we might need to we, meet a wee bit earlier on the 4th, um, but I'll keep members informed if that's going to happen. Um, but at the minute, 9.30, but we may need to meet at 9 if everyone comes who we've asked to come. Yeah. So that's the 4th of November then, potentially 9, but certainly no later than 9.30 here in the Senate Chamber will be our next meeting. OK, members, thank you very much, and uh, take care, and thanks for that. Okay. Thank you.